Hi guys, let's now begin our detailed look at the reactions of carboxylic acids and reactions of carboxylic acid derivatives. We will begin with this reaction here, converting a carboxylic acid to a acyl chloride, more commonly called an acid chloride because it comes from the carboxylic acid. And we will pick up here in our outline, Roman numeral 2. This is our first reaction of a carboxylic acid. Um, now, we can convert a carboxylic acid to an acid chloride using thionyl chloride, a reagent we saw before, or PCL5. Now, before we saw PCL3. Now, by far the most common is thionyl chloride. And we saw that before in converting a alcohol to an alkyl chloride, basically replacing the OH with, an, with a Cl. That's what we're doing here as well. But the eventual leaving group is not on a tetrahedral carbon. It is on an sp2 carbon. And so we need to make sure we do a correct mechanism on such a carbon. We keep in mind we do not break the sigma bond when a nucleophile comes in, instead we break the weaker pi bond. Okay, so some similarities to what we saw before with thionyl chloride, our structure, S double bond O with two chlorines, and if we complete that, we got two lone pairs here, three here, and the sulfur does have one lone pair, and thus it owns six, and it's neutral. But that sulfur is electrophilic. We have three more electronegative atoms pulling on it, leaving that sulfur partial plus. All right. The carboxylic acid will act as a nucleophile. This is an electrophilic site. Which, which oxygen do we want to react here? Well, the oxygen it, that we will react is actually the carbonyl because if you look at a resonance structure of a carboxyl group, this oxygen has some partial positive charge. All right. Um, if we take a carboxyl group, let me do it up top here. Uh, we have a little bit more room. We can show these electrons, okay. This lone pair is in a p orbital because it's conjugated next door. One of them is in a p orbital, the other one is in a hybrid. But we can start using this lone pair in resonance and move these here and move these out. The old in and out method, my terminology from organic one, and I'll just call that R. And now the oxygen becomes minus. and that oxygen becomes plus. And if we consider the hybrid here, it is going to be sort of a bond and a half. Okay, it's a net neutral. And so this is sort of the true structure of a carboxyl group. Um, and so of the two oxygens, the carbonyl oxygen actually has more minus charge. We can get to that quickly by understanding that one of these is in a p orbital and conjugated. Um, where the no lone pair on this oxygen is conjugated. So that's sort of, that's only a brief explanation, but that's sort of the starting point for understanding this. Ultimately, this oxygen has more electron density. Okay, the carbonyl oxygen. That's a lot like we said back over here for amides. You remember when I said amide that we have high electron density here? Okay. Well, it's especially high there. But it's, it's a little bit moderately high in uh, carboxylic acid. In any event, that's the oxygen that we're going to actually use as a nucleophile. These electrons come in here. 
we don't break the weaker bond. Instead, we move the pi bond away. And this would be a nucleophilic addition. And that's going to give, I'm just going to call that propyl group an R. Okay. This oxygen now bonded to sulfur. Electrons up, that oxygen becomes minus. We have chlorine and chlorine. We can keep a lone pair there. There's one lone pair here that becomes positive, and this be remains OH. All right. Now, often with carbonyl mechanisms, you can do maybe one step before the other. I am at this point going to take these electrons back down because anytime we can make a pi bond and kick off a leaving group, all right, it's easy to do. We could have shown resonance here first over here. I'm going to do this first. We can step back and see how we like this. That will give. Reform the double bond to oxygen. Uh, usually I kind of don't put lone pairs, but I feel like I need to put one on that sulfur because you guys often forget that. Of course, we're going to put a lone pair on a charged atom, but maybe not on those other two. We've got the OH. Okay. All right, a nucleophilic addition followed by elimination. This seems okay. Can we keep going? We did create a Cl minus. All right. Um, now, at this point, I'm going to do a nucleophilic addition. Now, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about what I can do. I'm not just memorized a mechanism. You have to think logically, okay, what are we trying to get? We're ultimately trying to get a, car a chlorine on that carbon. But right now, if we look at the carbonyl that's here, okay, it's positive. That's going to make the carbonyl more electrophilic at the carbon. Did we talk about that? Uh, indeed, we did. Which handout was that? Um, was it this one here? General concept. Protonation of carbonyl makes it more electrophilic. Okay. Slight difference here. Positive carbonyl. Here, it was made positive by protonation. But there may be other times we may encounter a positive oxygen in a carbonyl group. And when we do, same thing, it doesn't matter if this is an H or maybe a bond to sulfur. Bond to sulfur. This carbonyl is particularly reactive now at this point. Okay, we're primed to have nucleophilic addition here. What will that give us? R. Okay, that carbon now has a chlorine, an OH, oxygen with two long pairs, sulfur, double bond, chlorine. Yeah? All right. Everything is net neutral. Now, anytime you can make a pi bond and kick off a, a leaving group, Easy to do. Well, we want to get a carbonyl back on this carbon. What if we use these electrons and kick off that oxygen? It's almost like a tosylate. But remember, this is a fast step. We can, if you've ever seen an atom be negative, you can kick it off here. It can serve as a leaving group. That will give R. Okay. Double bond to oxygen, which we just formed right here. Got a bond to H, one lone pair left, that oxygen's positive, and what else is on that carbon? The chlorine. Plus O. Oh. 
Okay. Now look, that's just our acid chloride with protonated. Something can take the H. Well, this is not going to take the H here because this is going to be busy doing something else. Because anytime you can make a pi bond, you kick off a leaving group, that's easy to do, and that's going to give And there's one lone pair there. All right. That's SO2. There's your Lewis structure for SO2 plus Cl minus. And this anion can then come in and take this H, leave the lone pair behind. And that gives our products the HCl plus our neutral acid chloride. So, we work our way towards where we need to go. Both SO2 and HCl are gases. If you do this reaction, those will typically escape through the condenser. Now, you might want to scrub them, which means pass them into maybe some sodium hydroxide to neutralize them and then, uh, then discard. Uh, you don't want to contribute to acid rain and just release these into the environment. But because these escape as gases, uh, they, they are removed from your acid chloride product. And they don't sort of, you don't end up with a mixture. They're easily removed as gases. All right. We are doing carbonyl chemistry. You've got to think more broadly. All right. Ultimately, we did a nucleophilic addition followed by elimination. But we had to take care of a proton, and we had some other general concepts. Okay. Um, addition followed by elimination. But it wasn't as simple as just nucleophile adding. All right. First, we had sort of a kind of a precursor step. I'm not going to show PCL5. Uh, there's no carbonyl there. You might look at that. It is commonly used. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not as commonly used as thionyl chloride. That's the most common here. And with these acid chlorides or acid halides, you only see the chloride. There's just no need to make an acid bromide or acid iodide because the acid chloride is very reactive. It's used as an intermediate in synthesis and the other halogen uh, type compound is just not used um, hardly at all. Okay, uh, so we just, we can keep track of what we're doing in our outline page so we just looked at that you can fill in reagents as we go along what's next chemistry of acid chlorides all right we just made them let's look at the chemistry of them now first off how do you synthesize them well we just saw that and so for the just to be clear I will remind you of where we synthesize them, uh, but we can move on to B. All right. Reaction of acid chlorides with alcohols or water to give esters or acid. No catalyst needed since acid chlorides are very reactive as electrophiles. If you react an acid chloride with water, you will get back the carboxylic acid plus HCl if we show a balanced line reaction. All right. That would be called a hydrolysis reaction because anytime you react with water, it's called a hydrolysis. Um, now later when we react like esters, we'll see we need a catalyst for this. That is, because acid chlorides will react with pure water, you typically do not find them in nature. 
all right because water is everywhere you're only going to find them sort of in the lab they're made as an intermediate and then immediately used now you can buy them find them in stored in bottles very often when you open a bottle of an acid chloride you will often have a gas coming out which is HCl okay and you have to be careful you don't want to open a bottle of acid chloride in an open space because once the HCl escapes you'll be breathing it so you want to make sure you open them under the hood why would acid chloride be generated well if someone previously opened that bottle and moist air went in okay and any air is going to have some humidity in it if that water goes in this reaction can take place and the HCl will be generated in the bottle and when the next person comes along and opens the bottle that HCl gas will escape all right now some old bottles of acid chloride which are often liquids okay for example, benzoyl chloride is a liquid. All right. Where benzoic acid is a solid. But sometimes in old bottles of benzoyl chloride, you'll see some solid in the bottom. Okay? mainly liquid a little bit of solid that's probably where some benzoic acid has formed because someone opened the cap and let moist air in and the hydrolysis took place to form the carboxylic acid yeah of course when you open that bottle uh, you may also get a whiff of HCl if you're not careful and you don't want that in the end if you have a bottle of acid chloride that you buy you need to take care of it and do not let moist air in don't leave the cap off etc ultimately what I'm trying to drive home here is that an acid chloride will readily react with water including water that is in the atmosphere okay mechanism pretty straightforward we have H2O we have a pretty reactive carbonyl. These electrons will react here. Electrons up. That's going to give that tetrahedral intermediate after a nucleophilic addition at this time some will take care of the proton some will not um, let's do it both ways I'm just gonna move here if we do a proton transfer which we could do because that looks like an anion base it looks like hydroxide. This looks like H3O+. Plus. It looks like this is dying for the base to take an H. Okay, it may be intermolecular. This is a proton transfer, and we can put the H on that oxygen and take it off of that one, and we get to this point. And at this point, we see that both oxygens become equivalent. Now, anytime you can make a pi bond and kick off a leaving group, that's easy to do. Let's do that, and we get this plus Cl minus. And now this can take an H, leave electrons behind, and we will get our carboxylic acid just drawn upside down compared to normal plus HCl that's what we said we would get alright 
Now importantly, okay, this molecule is completely, everything is neutral there. All right. Some students may think, well, this is your final product. But let me ask you to remember, anytime you can make a pi bond and kick off a leaving group, that's going to happen. It's driven by entropy because one molecule turns into two. Now, that's only one atom. Okay, one becomes two. So we do not expect this. This, this here is not going to be stable. Uh, and it, it's driven this way, and we reform the carbonyl. It's driven by entropy. Also, carbonyl is a pretty strong bonding arrangement. Okay? Uh, there we go. Now, until, instead of doing proton transfer, okay, uh, let me just redraw this. It's worth taking some time here. Talking about general principles that we will see over and over. We need to address them. Some instructors at this point, instead of doing a proton transfer, will just come back down and kick off the chlorine. That's going to give our carbonyl reformed and we would have an oxygen like this plus Cl minus. Now this could take an H, these electrons stay behind and we could get the same products. The one possible issue here is what's a better leaving group? A chlorine or, or a protonated oxygen? And there could be an argument here. Indeed, some would argue that the oxygen is a better leaving group, and when this comes back down, you would kick off the water, and you would be reversing that back over there. But if we do a proton transfer first, okay, then, again, at this point, we also see that oxygens become equivalent during our mechanism. I could have, I could have used this to reform the pi bond. Okay. Um, now when this comes in, we say, what's a better leaving group, Cl or OH? And we have many reasons to say that the Cl is a better leaving group. So for that reason, I kind of like that better, but it's more common that probably uh, textbooks will just proceed this way. Either way is good for me. Um, make sure that you can do either really and you understand ultimately we're dealing with the proton all right so also keep in mind we're just using water here a lot of times students will all of a sudden say okay hydroxides react no there is no hydroxide pure water all right now, if you react an acid chloride with an alcohol, it again will react pretty darn easily, but you will get a ester. It's the same exact mechanism, except you have an R group here, okay? And if there's an R and an H, you only take the H, and thus you'll end up with an OR on your carbonyl and that is an ester. Same exact mechanism. All right. You should work through that and see it's all right. Um, so we can convert an acid chloride back to the carboxylic acid, right? Anything in the box can be converted back to now I just used I used aqueous acid here or I used water with acid catalyst you can actually use pure water. We can also convert an acid chloride to an ester. And we're showing that right here. All right. Now, of course, you, you don't have to only use pure water. You could use hydroxide. 
If you used hydroxide, the nucleophile then is hydroxide. You can work through that mechanism. All right. At the end, you would need to uh, protonate your carboxylic acid because if you hydrolyze it under basic conditions, it will exist in the basic form when we are done. All right. I not going to work through this mechanism here because at this point I would expect you to be able to do that mechanism on your own. If you think you have any problems then you can ask. All right. Need to be able to think generally enough to do this mechanism that's only slightly different than above. Okay, next, reaction of acid chlorides with amines. Typically either ammonia, primary amines, or secondary amines. And this will give amides. This is also known as acylation of amines. Because if you look at this nitrogen, after it reacted, the nitrogen is now bonded to an acyl group. So we acylated the nitrogen in making this amide. Now, lime reaction here, we see that we create HCl and that's going to give us problems. We may have already discussed that. Let's look at this. Uh, the ammonia is a good nucleophile. These electrons attack our carbonyl. Electrons up here, yeah. R minus. Okay. <clears throat> this point we could do proton transfer. All right. Uh, and get an, a neutral nitrogen and neutral oxygen. Instead, I'm going to do it sort of the other way. It's kind of more common. Uh, although I don't particularly like it as much. Bring these down and kick off the leaving group. Because... Which is a better leaving group, chlorine or positive nitrogen? Some may argue positive nitrogen. But in any event, let's do it this way. This gives us our carbonyl reformed. Plus Cl minus. And now the electrons can take the H, leave electrons behind, and we get our amide plus HCl. But the HCl is going to cause a problem here. It did not cause a problem above. It causes a problem here because the uh, amines are basic. It will start reacting with the HCl. Okay? You cannot keep the basic amine from reacting with the HCl. And ultimately, if you tried to do this reaction with one equivalent, one equivalent of everything, you would only get a half equivalent of the amide. Okay? Let's just focus on ammonia. If you use one equivalent, half equivalent of that nitrogen molecule would become amide. The other half would just become ammonium after it takes the H. And ultimately, you would only be using half of your acid chloride. That's kind of a waste. You're wasting half of your two main reagents. Now, a way to get around that is to just use two equivalents of the amine. Okay? In this case, ammonia. But you would only want to do that if the amine is cheap. All right? One equivalent here, two equivalents here. This one equivalent creates one equivalent of your amide, and the second equivalent of the amine just reacts with the HCl. An alternative is to include another base that will not react with the acid chloride to give an amide, but that will react with the HCl. 
okay? And that can include a tertiary amine or pyridine, which is not really considered a tertiary amine, but neither of these have H's to lose. And if you look at these, you cannot make an amide from either of these. You cannot isolate them and the nitrogen go neutral, like happened here. So, really, instead of the Cl taking this, you really want the amine to take it that we include, and maybe we include triethylamine, and it can take the H, all right? And we would, instead of making HCl, we would make Okay, if we use that instead, we would make that final product. And the triethylamine has, has essentially reacted with the HCl instead of the ammonia reacting, or whatever your amine is. That's if you <clears throat> use an alternative base. And you would want to do this if your amine was more expensive or, or if maybe it took you a year to make. Okay. I show two down here. In the first one, I use two equivalents of the amine. All right. One equivalent is going to be wasted to react with the HCl. That's okay. Methylamine is pretty pretty cheap. Down here, which by the way sort of shows the, the reverse line reaction. Here I have the amine as the main reactant, and I have the acid chloride on the reaction arrow. It's no different, they're still in the same flask. And here I use triethylamine, okay, this is TEA I showed here. And so it would be used as the base to take care of the HCl. Because in this case, you may not want to use two equivalents of this amine because this looks like it may be much more expensive than methylamine. Or maybe you spent a year making this. And we don't want to waste half of it. We'd rather use a cheaper alternative base to react with the HCl. By the way, this is called acetyl chloride. It is the acid chloride of acetic acid. Okay. And you should know that name of this compound. Acetyl chloride. Some people say acetyl chloride. That's where we just have a methyl coming off the carbonyl. Uh, so show the products there for homework and make sure you understand how we're dealing with the proton here. Two different ways to do that. Okay, making amides, uh, very common, and the most common way is to react an amine with an acid chloride. Hmm. Um, uh, looks like something is missing here. Uh, are we missing a page? So that should not be next. Um, let me check to see if we're, how we're missing a page here, guys.
Okay, I see we're missing a page. I'm going to print that out real quick. Not sure how that happened in my handout. Okay, uh, it looks like it is in the handout that I posted on the uh, Teams page. Uh, next, why are acid chlorides key intermediates for acylation opposed to the carboxylic acid? All right, the answer is pretty straightforward. Let's make sure we focus on this and, and understand this key point. If you try, try to take a carboxylic acid and react it with a strong nucleophile, that includes amines, okay? Now, amines are not super strong, but they are considered strong. All right, we classified them as strong nucleophiles in organic one. All right, these strong nucleophiles are going to act, okay, as bases because we have an acidic H. For example, the ammonia that we used in our previous mechanism, instead of trying to act at the carbonyl, it will not. Instead, it will react and take an H. This is an acid. Yes, it's a weak acid, but it's still an acid. And that will give the carboxylate anion, okay, in this case, plus ammonium ion. You'll make this ion pair or salt, the ammonium carboxylate. And at that point, nucleophilic acyl substitution chemistry is not going to happen because the carboxylate is very unreactive towards nucleophiles. Only a super strong nucleophile will ever add to this carbonyl, and I don't think we'll ever do it in this class. No, we will not. If you get to the carboxylate, game over. Nothing's going to happen here. No reactivity. All you will get is acid-base chemistry. But if we first convert this to the acid chloride using, of course, thionyl chloride, now we can come in with a strong nucleophile, such as ammonia, or something even stronger like a Grignard reagent, or maybe a, uh, some other carbanion, etc. But now there's no acidic OH. And now we'll get the nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl. Okay? There you go. And you can proceed with a nucleophilic acyl substitution. All right? So that's the big benefit of the acid chloride. Now, we'll also be able to do this chemistry with anhydrides and esters because those also don't have the OH. But as we've already said, those are less reactive than acid chlorides. So the acid chloride is sort of the best. All right. Now, one problem with acid chlorides is, sort of like we mentioned over here, that is they don't store well, all right? Because they react with, they're, they're so reactive that they start reacting with water in the atmosphere. So for that reason, the next functional group, anhydrides, is actually sometimes um, just as preferred. Although they're never going to be as good as the acid chloride, okay. Um, chemistry of acid and hydrides. Why don't we introduce what an anhydride is and then we'll pick up here in the next video. All right. Um, an anhydride, first off, has the structure. It's an oxygen bonded to two carbonyls. All right, and we can have symmetrical anhydrides. Basically, you've got our group here and here, okay? In each case, they're both CH3 groups in this example. 
But in this example, one R group is a benzene ring, abbreviated as phenyl, while the other group, other R group is a methyl. So they're not the same. This is a symmetrical anhydride. This is often called a mixed anhydride. You could also call it a non-symmetrical anhydride, but mixed anhydride is a very common term when the two R groups are different. Okay. Now the anhydride I show here, um, is called acetic anhydride. That's because it comes from acetic acid. All right. And I can show how it is made, but that's actually shown below. And let's go ahead and show that. If you take acetic acid and just heat it pretty high temperature, these two will actually react together to give the anhydride, okay? Uh, acetic anhydride in this case, plus water. Now this is usually going to be as steam because this is usually maybe above 100 degrees and at that temperature the water will be steam and it will be driven away. And that's good because the anhydride could react with water and go backwards. Now since we're removing water from this compound here, we are dehydrating it and we can also then call the product an anhydride. The carboxylic acid has lost water. But in doing this, it took two equivalents. That's where the, this is two carbons and this is four. All right. Um, now this method here is called a thermal dehydration of a carboxylic acid. It's actually only good for making symmetrical anhydrides. Because if you try to thermally react two different carboxylic acids, you're going to get three different products as possible. If this acid reacted with itself, you would get that anhydride. If this acid reacted with itself, you would get acetic anhydride. But you could also have where this one reacts with that one and that would give this mixed anhydride. These three would be very difficult to separate. If you just wanted this one, well you would just only heat this one by itself. All right. Ultimately, what that's kind of make, should make sense. If you only want this anhydride, you just heat this like we did above. The only question may be, well, how do you make the mixed anhydride? Well, it's not going to be a good yield if you try to react these two together because you're also going to get the other two. Okay, so that's one way to make anhydrides. We've actually seen, or we will see another way in section 2C. Um, Where was 2C? Um, I think we're missing pages here. I think what happened to this handout is I probably copied it uh, and did not copy it correctly and I only got the front pages um, okay, missing some things here. I'll have to clean this handout up and, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, but for what we've covered, um, We'll end there in this video, an introduction to anhydrides. Uh, it's a new functional group for us. It's typically not included on the functional group list in Organic 1. 
um, but it is an important acid derivative and we will s learn how to do chemistry with them in the next video. Okay guys, I'll get the complete handout. I think the ones post posted is, uh, is good.